Hey, everybody. I'm really bummed that we can't actually physically gather here right now um, together because the word church actually means, you know, the gathered body of believers. So I'm bummed that we can't actually gather, at least not in the normal way. Um, but at the same time, I'm super grateful that we have the technology to be able to do this. At least we can gather in this way. And in this season where people are really being forced to isolate, it's just somehow comforting to know that we're all experiencing the same thing at the same time. You know, it's like we're together in a different way. Um, I also want to let you know that we are going to try to put together... Um, some virtual small groups. We're working on that. We've worked on it this week. Um, probably be able to communicate something uh, this coming week about how that's going to work. But, you know, connecting virtually, that's, that's our new reality. It's a really strange and unsettling time, isn't it? And, you know, my heart is so burdened by uh, what this plague or this um, pandemic is doing uh, to each of you. I, I don't actually know anyone personally that's going, that actually has the virus, but um, <clears throat> just the threat of, of death that's all around us, um, it, it's really stealing people's peace and, and kind of their sense of well-being. And, you know, the unprecedented response of our government to shut down businesses and schools and even places of worship, uh, it's affecting every single part of our lives. And it seems like a, a terrible time to have to isolate, doesn't it? So let's find new and different ways and creative ways to connect and to, and to have community. <clears throat> and let's find ways to um, encourage each other and to, you know, just strengthen each other in the Lord because many people are in fear that they're actually going to, you know, not even be able to get the necessities of life like food and water and, of course, toilet paper. <laughs> and then there's the, then there's the threat of the, the financial crisis that's kind of looming. You know, we have several business owners and manager level people that are part of our congregation um, and they're carrying the weight of the people that, that they support, the people that depend on them. They're carrying the weight of the fact that they may lose their company uh, because they can't function right now. Um, and there's others who, you know, maybe just don't have uh, any kind of financial buffer to fall back on, you know, that these are people that they can't go one week without a check or it's going to cause uh, significant problems. And, you know, this is affecting the church too because I'm, I'm here preaching to an almost empty room and, you know, and that means we can't receive offerings. So um, we're all feeling it. We're all trusting God to, to see us through this. I do want to mention if you are able to, if you still have an income and you can continue to support Renovate, uh, please continue to do that. There's options on our website. Um, there's options on, I think even this video is going to have a donate button. So if you can give, um, please do. And, you know, if you can't, we are standing with you and we're all in this together. You know, I've been wrestling big time trying to weed through the the, all the natural stuff that we're experiencing here and to get to a place where I'm centered on God so I can offer something encouraging uh, to all of you from the Lord. And I, I really believe God gave me that this week. Uh, so we're actually going to continue our series called Counterculture. And it is times like this where we most desperately need the counterculture of Jesus meaning we desperately need to know how does God think about this? You know, how, how does he tell us that we should uh, respond to what's going on? Because if we don't think right about it, we're not going to respond right, and, and actually we're not going to feel right. And that's actually the position that many people are in. They're very displaced, confused, and, and weighed down. 
many Christians are confused about why God would even allow something like this to happen. Um, but you know what? God never promised that, that we wouldn't suffer. He never said that. In fact, Jesus said the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So he, he never promised that we wouldn't suffer. Um, what he did promise was that we could experience peace even in the suffering, even in the hardship. So that's what today's message is about. The title is Peace That Transcends, and it's based on Philippians chapter 12. Uh, but before we read that, let's go ahead and just open with a word of prayer. God, I just pray that the authority and power of your word would wash over us as we take it in. And I just pray that um, it would replace the fear and anxiety that's permeating the hearts of so many right now, God. Help us to remember that we are your people and you're our God and we trust you, God. We trust you uh, no matter what the outcome is of all this stuff. So we pray your blessing on this message, your Holy Spirit to come here and in each home and with each person uh, as they experience this message together. Strengthen us by your spirit and by your word, I pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Philippians 12, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I don't think there's a more perfect passage in the, in the whole Bible for our circumstances than this one. The author was Paul, the apostle, and uh, he was definitely no stranger to suffering. In fact, when he penned these words, he was imprisoned in Rome. And at this point in his life, he had been through probably more than anything that any of us will ever go through, at least I hope so. Um, and there's, there's a list of that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it just, you can look there and you'll see some of the things that Paul had to go through. But even though he experienced all of that, even though he was literally in chains as he's writing this, and even though the people that he's writing to were also experiencing some pretty significant suffering, he starts out this little encouragement with the word rejoice. And then as if he was going to anticipate, you know, what, what, the people's response would be, you know, like rejoice. Are you serious? Do you understand what we're going through? As if to an anticipate that, he says, let me say it again. Rejoice. Now, this seems like a, a weird thing to think about in the face of suffering, but that's actually uh, found in several places in Scripture. In, in James, you know, he says, consider a pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that it's going to turn out for your good. So even though it seems weird to say that in a time like this, um, it's really not if you think about it this way. If you really trust God, you know that these things are going to turn out for your good. It also seems weird that he would say, let your gentleness be evident to all. <laughs> yeah. Gentleness is not what people seem to be feeling right now when the proverbial excrement hits the oscillating device. They're not feeling generous. But when you stop and think about, you know, what we're actually experiencing, what, what we're going through right now, it actually makes a lot of sense that Paul would encourage us to be gentle because we've been seeing how crazy people can get. One of my boys was telling me um, that he saw this video of a guy that went to, actually, I don't know if it was a guy, a person that went to uh, a, a store to get toilet paper and, you know, everybody's running out. So this guy has a cart 
like with eight packs of toilet paper in it, and there was one left, and someone else came along and they grabbed it, and the guy with eight packs of toilet paper actually fought the guy with one and took it away from him. That's what fear does to people. So Paul is writing, in the midst of hardship, let your gentleness be evident to all. See, it makes sense when you think about it in real life, doesn't it? In chapter one, where he's actually encouraging the people that he's writing to, um, he says to them, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a worthy manner, a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So let's not lose our heads. Let's not lose our decency with other people in times like this. And Paul gives us a reason that we should respond rightly. He says, the Lord is near. You know, the Lord, the creator of the universe, the all-powerful God that you serve. Yeah, him, he's near. Even in times like this, he's near. Psalm 23 says it this way, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death or the, the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We're never alone. Not if you're isolated, not in the darkest valley where there's the threat of death all around you. And even when, you know, you don't see a way around the, this financial, this looming financial crisis that all of us believe is coming. The Lord is near. So Paul says, because of that, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, don't freak out. Don't let fear grip your heart. Don't worry about what might happen or even what is happening. You know, there's all kinds of of rumors going around. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this week things like, you know, somebody knows somebody that, you know, they have it on good authority that something really bad is about to happen. Multiple times I've heard that this week. Listen to me, don't take that in. Don't take that on yourself. Don't carry that. It's okay to plan. It's okay to prepare. Um, But listen, you can't respond to every rumor. You can't prepare for every scenario. And you shouldn't even try. My point is, is that if fear is gripping your heart, (coughs) <coughs> then the enemy is involved. You can, be, you can be sure of that. Why? Because the enemy hates peace. He hates peace. He hates the prince of peace. And he loves fear. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. <coughs> <coughs> God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And the enemy is the father of lies. So I think most of what we're hearing, most of what's being presented are from the enemy. They're lies. So don't be anxious about anything, Paul says. Pray in all of it and keep praying. He says, petition the throne of God and be grateful. You know, we... Even in this time, we have so much to be grateful for. We have a roof over our heads. We have heat. We have indoor plumbing. We have warm beds to sleep in. We have technology where even though we can't be together, we can still be together. We have a lot to be thankful for. And the truth is, you guys, at least at this point, there's not a lot of actual suffering going on. It's actually the threat of suffering, right? I'm not trying to minimize. Maybe some people aren't getting paid already and feeling it. Um, I'm just saying, for the most part, at least with the people I know, it's just about the threat. Well, listen, gratitude offsets that. If we focus on 
the 5% of bad and not the 95% of good, that becomes our reality. And that leads me to the next thing. Paul says that um, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. See, if we, bring, if we address this in, in prayer instead of anxiety, that's where God's peace comes. It comes and it doesn't even make sense. It transcends understanding, it says. It's not because God magically comes and takes us out of the situation, right? It's not because he, he you know, makes everything right. That, that doesn't transcend any understanding, does it? No, that, you know, of course you're gonna have peace then. But God's kind of peace is above and beyond the circumstances. Actually, many times it's despite the circumstances. Then it says, it will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus. What comes under attack in times like this? It's our hearts and our minds. So I just want to take a minute to think about both of those kind of dimensions of, of, of the self, the heart and the mind. What is our heart? Well, the heart is the, is the core of what we are. It's the executive center of, of every human. And that's why, you know, when big things happen, we say, man, that rocked me to the core, right? Meaning it affects our hearts. The things that are happening right now are affecting people's hearts. And there's a metaphor in scripture in many places in the Bible where, you know, it talks about people's hearts melting with fear. Here's one example from King David. He was uh, crying out to God because all these different nations were trying to destroy Israel. And he was like weary and he was freaking out because, you know, in the natural, they could take Israel out like that. What he said was, my heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. Can you relate to that? I mean, is your heart melting with fear over what's happening? I know it's true for many of people. But, you know, there's also places where David prayed, train my hands for war. Give me the heart of a lion. This is what we need, the heart of a lion, not a melting heart. There's a great Bible story um, that I want to share with you that really illustrates what I'm trying to communicate. You probably are all familiar with um, the story of how God used Moses to deliver the, the children of Israel from Egypt. If you remember, they, were, they had to wander the wilderness for many years because they rebelled against God. And um, at the end of that season, that period of time, they were just on the outskirts of the promised land, the place where God said, this is the place I'm going to give you. So they're just on the outskirts of that. And Moses sent in uh, about a dozen guys to explore the land, to see how good it was, you know, to see what kind of people they were up against, you know, if they moved into there, are these people going to attack? Are they good warriors? Are they, you know, what are you facing? So so these 12 guys go in and they spend 40 days looking around and, they, and then they come back and they give their report. And uh, this story is in Numbers 13 and 14, I believe. Um, so they come back and they give their report and they reported that indeed the land is amazing. It's amazing for crops. It's amazing for animals. Uh, but there's no way we can go there because... The people are fierce. They're incredible warriors. They have walls, and there's even giants. Remember Goliath? There's even some giants that live there. So they're like, you know, we can't do this. No way. All of them said that except for one guy named Caleb. And his response was, listen, this is not a problem for God. God promised that we were going to uh, occupy this land. So... Let's do this. You know, he's like, let's go. And he was the only one, though. And later when he was recalling this story, here's what he said. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites went up with, who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord, my God, wholeheartedly. So think about this. Caleb saw exactly the same thing as the 11 other guys, right? He, experienced, he saw all the same things, experienced all the same things, um, but two totally different responses. The other 11, they, they were like, instead of trusting God that he was going to do what he promised to do, most of them freaked out and said, you know, these people will wipe us out. And you know what? In the natural, if you were only looking at it that way, they absolutely could have wiped them out. But Caleb knew that God promised that this was where they were going to live. So he, his report reflected his faith. His report reflected his trust in God. But the people who were afraid, um, it says they made the hearts of the people melt in fear. We need to be very, very careful right now. Listen, don't let your hearts melt with fear over the threat of, of what's in front of us. And don't repeat those reports to other people. Don't make other people's hearts melt with fear. Caleb trusted God. So even in the face of seemingly impossible odds, he was able to say, I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So if you can say that, if God is your God, then he promises to work all of this to our good. Do you believe that? He's going to work it for our good. It doesn't mean you're not going to go through some stuff. But even that stuff will be used for your good. Even the trouble, even the battle was used for the children of Israel's good. And he'll guard our hearts and minds if we respond with prayer and gratitude rather than anxiety. So we believe the report of the Lord in spite of the threats of the enemy. Even though those threats, in, in a worldly sense, they're valid. These are things that could actually happen. Some of these things are things that are likely to happen, right? So that's kind of the mind part of the heart and mind. He'll guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What does it mean by the mind? It's like, what do you believe? You see, what you believe can lead to your heart melting or it can lead to, you know, peace even in the middle of the worst possible scenarios. There's the rumors, there's the reports, right? There's the, the, uh, the, the threats that we're hearing constantly. I've heard so many of them this week, I can't even count them. But then there's what you believe about those things. That's where peace comes, if you believe rightly about it. It's not denying reality. It's not, you know, ignoring the truth. It's just trusting that, that God's going to work all things together for good to those that love him and are called to his purpose. Do you trust him? Do you? Do you really trust him? Because he is God. And we need to tell our souls, calm down and put your trust in God. That's what David did. That's exactly what he did. He said, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, 
for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So rather than asking, you know, why would God allow this? Why don't you speak to your own soul and say, why are you not trusting God? Put your hope in God. So I want to close up with um, a song that I wrote a few, a few years ago, and it really speaks directly to what I'm saying in this message, that, that you're never alone, even if you're isolated, um, even if you know, you're experiencing the threat of death around you, even if you're terrified of the financial implications of this whole thing. God is God in the good times and in the bad. And this song is called King of Night and Day. With none but you, my God Journey on my way Alone But what is there to fear Lord, when you are near O oh, King of night and day safe am I within your hand than if the host did around me stand oh Lord Never without you, never without you, O King of night and day, for safe am I. separates us no high no depth no sin no pain nothing separates us
Father, thank you for the power of your word and the power of your church and the gathering even in this setting. Lord, I pray that you would give us courage in the face of adversity, in the face of the threat of death and fear of financial ruin. God, I just pray that you would give us the heart of a lion, Father. Train our hands for war. God, deliver us in Jesus' name.